prepare to be dazzled. Um, have you guys all read Gotham Academy? Can everyone hear me okay? Is that it's important? Yeah. Uh, so if you haven't read Gotham Academy, there's some spoilers in here. So you might want to, I don't know, just, yeah. We'll just go through it together. Um, I guess I'll start a little bit by, uh, this is a new series. Um, and it, we, it just came out in, um, I think, October. I can't remember right now. Yeah. Um, and so we pitched it in February, actually. Uh, Mark Doyle, who was uh, my editor at Vertigo for a while, uh, he just got promoted to the head bat editor, Batman group editor, that's, that's the term, it's a technical term. Batman group editor, and uh, he was calling up a bunch of people he had worked with in the past. Um, and since we had a good working relationship, he's like, you know, whatever you want to do, like if you want to pitch something, I'd love to work with you on something Batman, Gotham related, whatever that is. And so, you know, we talked a little bit on the phone. Um, at the time I was in Montreal, and uh, I actually shared a studio with Carl and Brendan, who, Brendan comes and hangs, hangs out with us. We have lunch and stuff, but he's not, a, he's not there all the time. So uh, when, he, when, when Mark called me uh, to talk about Gotham, that happens, that was crazy. Uh, he calls up and he's like, you know, we, we're talking about um, the lack of young adult stuff. And I was suggesting, you know, I'd love to do something for younger readers. And he's like, do you have any ideas? And I was like, yes, I have an idea. And it's called Gotham Academy. And he's like, well, what is it? And I was like, well, like Harry Potter plus Batman. How you can't really go wrong. That's a good formula right there. So he's like, okay, well, are you going to write it? Are you going to draw it? And I was like, I think I'm going to write it. But uh, my friend Brendan's going to help. And Brendan kind of looks up because he was in the studio. And I was like, no, don't worry. It's fine. It's cool. Shush, shush, you know? And, uh, and he's like, well, who's going to draw it? And I was like, well, I think Carl Kershaw would be a good artist for this. And Carl kind of looks over from his desk from where he's sitting. It's kind of like that because I'm over there. And I was like... No, don't worry, Carl. It's fine. Don't worry. I'll explain. I'll tell you later. Don't worry about it. And uh, and he said it sounds good. He's like, well, how long is it going to be? I was like, well, forever. It's going to go on forever. Don't worry. It'll be cool. And he said, good. Write me a pitch. And uh, and we did. Afterwards, you know, I was talking with Brendan and Carl, and the three of us are kind of on the same page about everything. You know, immediately when I explained what I wanted, uh, you know, the ideas for it, they were just on board, and we just started, like you know, having ideas go back and forth and going out for lunches about it. And yeah, that's what we do. We have lunch. Uh, really, it's just sitting around talking about Batman all day, which is cool. And uh, yeah, we, we, it, the, the story came together so organically. And I'm, I think, I'm not sure DC knew exactly what we were doing. So they just kind of let us do whatever we wanted because they were just, I'm, I'm not sure they really got it at first. Um, and, and it's all new characters. We've been able to it's really kind of the freedom that they've given us with it and the support they've shown for the book has been really good. Um, there's been a few weird kind of trip ups along the way, but I think uh, so far we're, we're all really happy with it. Um, and Carl's drawing it. We've have a, we've had a few changes on the colors, but yeah, so far, yeah, this is the first the first cover. I think this is one of the first images Carl drew of the book. And uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say. It's, a, it's like the perfect cover. I love it. Page one. Welcome to Gotham Academy. Um, I don't. It's 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 really weird to look at it and talk about it like this because the whole thing was such a, a collaborative process. Um, right, there's actually a big spoiler on this page, and I don't want to give anything away. But if you're keen and you look at it, there's a you know maybe something kind of crazy. I think I think when we finish the series in like ten years, you're gonna look back on this page and be like, "Oh my God, I see it." But right now, it's kind of obscure. And we we actually we're so bad at this. We uh, we're, we're so bad about this because we set everything up. There's so many setups in this first issue. Um, yeah, next next page. Yeah, Olive and Maps. Olive is the, the you guys have all read this, right? So Olive Silverlock, our main character, and Maps Mizuguchi and Mia. I guess her real name. Um, they really haven't changed since the first, uh, the first pitch. When we set out to, to do this story, Olive was kind of our main character, and she's always been there since like the very first, uh, you know, our first draft of the story. And Maps has always been there as like her foil, and we wanted to create almost like a Batman and Robin kind of duo, where you have like Maps in this Robin-esque, kind of, younger sidekick kind of character. But, uh, you know, she really stands on her own. But the two of them make a really good team. Um, and it was really important because Olive is so internal in this first issue to give her someone to bounce off, off of, and and that was kind of the whole, the whole thing. 
And Carl's art on this, oh my god, it's amazing. Look at that Dracula hand in like that third panel, it's so good. <laughs> There's so much Dracula in this book, it's ridiculous. Uh, he just went like, and that's what I'm saying, like we, all we had to do was say like, you know, page one, we barely even described it, but like, on that first panel and with the door, there's like some scratch marks. I don't know if you can see it. There's like scratch marks on the door. We don't even like, he just put those in there. And I was like, what made that scratch mark? He's like, I don't know, isn't that great? I was like, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so we got to figure out what made those scratch marks, but something crazy did. And I'm sure that we'll get to it at some point. But this is like all things that, you know, later on is going to feed into, um, you know, the greater mythology of the school and the idea that it's been here forever. And, you know, just no one's written about it yet. Ah, uh, yes, that's, uh, Hammerhead, the headmaster, headmaster Hammer. It's actually a, a, a nod to Hammer films because we're all kind of uh, horror nerds. So uh, there, there's so many like winks and nods to different things in here that we just are, are passionate about. And there's so many candles in this series. It's like, don't they have electricity at this school? <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of difficult, this first issue, uh, the fact that we're introducing this whole new school and all new characters, um, so we, we wanted to find a way to give you all this information without making it feel like an info dump. Um, so of course there's a few, you know, bigger panels with a lot of words in it, and I think as an artist, when I come at a script, I tend to pare things down and what's the least amount of words you can use on a page because um, I, I just think about things so visually and I like telling a story without if I can tell a story without any words, you know, that's, that's good. Um, but, but sometimes it's unavoidable. But I think characters like Hammerhead and making these, you know, kind of quirky and fun makes the dialogue, like, less... Uh, it, it feels less like exposition and it feels a little more fun and, and brings you in a little bit to the, to the world. Oh my god, this page. When Carl showed me this, I, like, I, like, died so good. And then I resurrected and then I died again. <laughs> and they brought me back to life. Um, it was, yeah, incredible. One thing that's fun about this is the narration, and it's all from Olive's point of view. Um, working with Brendan, working with a second writer on this book is great. And, uh, you know, when, when we, we sit down and we, we talk through the plot, it's very organic, actually. When Brendan and I work, we sit down. We like to do this, like, face-to-face, -face, and if we can't, we Skype um, just to see each other. Um, but we'll, you know, work through the plot. We, we have the whole six issues. Uh, we, have, we actually have, like, three years of material lined up. We do six issues, and, uh, and we, we bullet point everything, make sure each issue works individually, and then we go in and kind of break it down page by page. We say, what happens on this page? How many pages is this scene? And we kind of have to fit every... It's like a puzzle. And a lot of times we'll end up getting to the writing process and like rearranging things. We'll take scenes out. We've moved, we've bumped scenes from one issue to the next issue. You know, it's really just finding a way to make each issue work on its own and then making sure the whole thing reads as a graphic novel because I think that's what... Um, in the end, that's what's going to have the longest shelf life. So you have to think about, in a monthly series, you're thinking about, you know, how are people going to read it month by month because you want people to be satisfied but want to come back for more. But then when you read it in a trade, how is it going to, is it going to feel like you're jumping around? Is there, um, so a lot to think about when you're doing a monthly book. And then, um, and then Brenda and I will just split up each each issue. Sometimes I'll be like, well, I'll write the first half, you write the second half. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, I really want to write this scene and he's sometimes he'll really want to write another scene and then we'll just kind of we, we work in google docs so we just cram it all into like one big document at the end and then um i underwrite and he overwrites so <clears throat> it's a matter of beefing up my scripts and filling in my dialogue with um i'll when i write dialogue i write the bare minimum of like what should be said and he overwrites so he writes everything that he just you know, it just comes into his head. So it's a matter of him beefing up my dialogue and me paring his down to actually fit in a balloon. So it works out really well. And then I think we end up getting a script that is, um, you know, kind of healthy and we, we work over each other's stuff and what I'm bad at, he's good at and vice versa. So it works really well. And then Carl just brings the whole thing to life. And um, he just does such crazy layouts. We don't even have to like, sometimes I'll be like this, you know, maybe like a, I'll suggest something and he never listens to anything I suggest. So uh, I don't even bother really um, suggesting too much anymore. But uh, yeah, the way he tells stories is just incredible. Like this page, it's insane. But yeah, the, uh, the, the narration is a lot of fun from Olive's POV and I think it helps get you into her, her head a little bit. And uh, yeah, uh, we, we have, okay. Um, last panel in here is little Professor Milo. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Milo at all. He's a, uh, in the Langstrom serum, if there's any like 
Batman nerds in the house, you might, you might recognize that guy. That's fun. But we kind of get like a whole uh, different views. And if you look closely at the Kyle panel, he's got a picture of him and Olive on his locker. Little things like that that just make it like so, uh, you know, you're getting quiet little moments with characters that you're going to meet over the next few issues. Heathcliff with his guitar. It's nice. And uh, yeah, here's where we meet the uh, Pomelin. She's one of my favorite characters. And it's so great because she's such a, from the beginning, we knew she was going to be everyone's favorite, but it's going to take her a few issues to actually like get there. So we, we just had her be like the biggest bitch in the world. And this first, first and second issue. And then you kind of see like a softer, like, that's how people are, you know. You might meet someone and you're like, oh man, I hate that person. But then after you get to know them, you're like, well, actually, we kind of have a lot in common or, you know, you see things from a different angle. So we did that kind of with Pomelin and here and she's a bit aggressive and uh, her, and, her and Olive actually becoming, I wouldn't say friends, but like, you know, comrades, I suppose. <laughs> like, uh, you know, they end up having to work together and uh, watching them work together is really fun because they just hate each other all the time. There's actually a guy in that panel, actually, if you go back on the upper right, I don't even know what his name is. <laughs> this upper, yeah, the upper right-hand corner. It's Heathcliff Pomelin and who's that? I don't know who that is. We'll have to figure that out before the next issue, I guess. <coughs> Yeah, that's. I should make a note, right? So text Brendan right now. Brendan, who's this guy? <laughs> this stuff is so much fun, like the history of Gotham City and adding all this stuff in, like the the history of the Cobblepots and the Civil War. It's almost like writing a lesson plan, but it's actually fun because it's like, oh, what are you doing today? Well, I'm researching the Cobblepots. Okay. But all of this is just set up. So we've got uh, Colton. Uh, it's down here in the middle panel, the bottom middle. And then Pomelin again, and we were like, can we get away with using the finger? And we we're like, we can't because it's like, it's an all ages book, but we have her like, if you look really close, she's like, uh, like, <laughs> there's so, we got away with so much in this book. I can't believe it. It's so good. And uh, it, yeah, it's just been fun. But that, oh, Olive, in the rain, I can't, Carl's so good. I wish he was here right now. Oh, man. Yeah, okay, I'm just gushing over Carl's art right now. Ah, oh, the waffles. <laughs> I love it. I love when Carl draws food. Um, that was actually something when I was talking to the guys about, I was like, we have to have a lot of lunch specials in here because I feel like when you're building a world, you're introducing someone to a new place, I feel like eating is so important. I mean, that's one of the big things when you read a lot of fantasy novels or um, anything where you want to immerse someone in it, you put food in there because it's such a universal thing and it, it really... Yeah, Studio Ghibli, yeah, it's a good, good one. Um, Spirited Away is a great example, and just, it just adds an element of like, oh man, those waffles look so good. I love waffles so much. Um, yeah, it, but it was just, um, it's one of those things that we're constantly trying to put in, like to make the world just that much more real and that much more, uh, more fun. So this lunch was, uh, and you guys watch Batman and Beyond? Batman Beyond, there's a little Batman Beyond hint on this. I don't want to give it away, but if, you're, if you go through this later, if you can catch the Batman Beyond reference on this page, I'll be very, very, you get A plus for sure. And there's Kyle, Kyle with this little plaza. He's like the school tennis hunk. Um, this little aside, Mark Doyle, the Batman group editor, used to play tennis when he was younger. And I found out about this once we were, um, it was San Diego, like three or two or three years ago, when we were out back at the Hyatt. They had closed all the bars, so we just had a six pack of something, and we were drinking behind the on the stairs, because that's because we're because we're high schoolers. Um, <laughs> and uh, he he starts mentioning he used to play tennis, and I was like, ah, put that in my little memory bank. So when I pitched Gotham Academy, I was like, Kyle Mizuguchi, star tennis player at. Uh, Gotham Academy and of course Mark was like approved <laughs> so it's kind of a matter of knowing you know who you're pitching to and this is really just a sports comic in disguise wait until we get to the tennis stuff you guys are gonna love it <laughs> more lunch stuff this is all this is all set up it's it's crazy this is um this stuff with the Colton oh there's a you remember Aunt Harriet you guys I don't know, Batman fans yeah Aunt Harriet's in there she's the lunch monitor <laughs> And <laughs> it's so good, it's so dumb, I love it. Like we, we've just been able to use like every, everybody. The, the stuff with the fireworks here is something that uh, is 
continues through the next few issues. So then uh, actually issue five, we come back to it, I think. So it's all stuff that's like lead up and, you know, so hopefully when you read it in the trade, it's like something that happens here is like, we'll keep paying off. Um, this kind of starts off a little, I don't want to say war between uh, Olive and Colton, but when they finally get to, I think issue three, the detention, they kind of sort it out and but yeah, it's it's fun to, to plant little things like this, something that seems like completely irrelevant and like, oh, it's just, you know, he's he's getting detention now, but then we see him in detention later, you kind of know why, and uh, all the fireworks stuff comes back to haunt everyone, so yeah, it's fun. Uh, here's when we first talk about Olive's mom, and you, you this is like a big, oh, and her roommate Lucy, <laughs> so much fun. Uh, this is kind of a mystery of what, and, and we're kind of getting into it. And if you guys read Arkham Manor, there's a big, uh, I, maybe spoiler almost, in a, one of the new issues that Arkham Manor came out about Olive's mom and what she's been doing. But yeah, it's uh, every every hero's got to have like kind of a tragic backstory. So we're getting getting to the meat of that and what happened there. It's actually it's really fun and it's um, relevant I think too when we when we start talking about it, but. It's something that you don't want to reveal too quickly, you know, and I think that's been some people's frustration with this series is what happens, why aren't we finding it out? And it's like, you just got to let it, let it happen, you know, just wait for it. It'll be all that much more satisfying when these things actually come out because, you know, it's like in real life when you get to know someone, you're not going to, they're not going to tell you everything about them right away. You have to get to know these characters and I think spilling the beans too quickly upon things makes you, you know, it's, it's, it's the time and the build up. so. That's it's it's a doing this comic and having it be kind of a mystery and walking that line between uh, revealing things too quickly and not revealing things quickly enough because you want to give readers uh, something to think about and you know after they finish each issue feel satisfied but you also want them to want to know more so there's that constant balance and every time we finish the outline of an issue we look back and we say okay what can we where have we have we said enough do we need to say more have we said too much um and it's almost like we we know how the main story arc is going to go and then it's almost writing it backwards when you're doing a mystery so <laughs> it's been a it's been a little funny oh and that sad little picture which actually comes back to that picture i think in issue two i don't remember yeah maps finds it and it's like why is this picture ripped in half because she's totally clueless <laughs> i love maps yeah, she has trouble controlling the volume on her voice. It's great. Like if, if this was, if we did like a reading of it, we'd have to get someone in here who could just yell at the top of their voice almost the entire time. She's great. <coughs> and Lucy is like a, Lucy the roommate. It's like a Dracula reference, you know, just that every, everything in here is Dracula's. If you're not, if you're not sure. Oh, and like, oh, we have to go back again. <laughs> the posters on her wall, there's like a, what would Mr. Darcy do? And uh, at the bottom it says, I would struggle in vain, and I can struggle in vain and bear it no, no, no longer. And on the other one, it's a little House of Secrets poster, which is a film Carl made up, and it stars uh, Carlo. So if anyone's familiar with uh, yeah, history of that name. Some more Batman stuff. Just all these Easter eggs. We've just been, it's great. A headless statue holding a lantern and a sword. Awesome, Carl, you're so good. This is such a nice scene. It was uh, really quiet, and we were able to play these two off each other. The great thing about writing Olive uh, as such a melancholy character and someone who's so introverted and really uh, going through a hard time, we wanted to make her, the, the first issue, her arc was kind of coming out of her shell. In the beginning, she's very much like pushing people away. And in the end, we have to have her realize that she needs maps, like as a friend. Um, the two of them work really well together, but we didn't want to have her, you know, it has to happen naturally. So over the course of this issue, for her to come to that realization um, on her own was really important. So we wrote that really carefully. And I love that Maps keeps the sketchbook. It's great. It's so much fun. We do these little, um, like, font porn things at the beginning of each, each scene with the Professor McPherson and then the lunch thing, and then this one is the assembly. Do we have any any um, detective stories, like 1970s detective stories fans in the house at all?
because that clock with the arrow in it, that's a big, that's a thing. <laughs> that's a thing from an old comic. So we're, we're planning all these ideas to like maybe use later. But having all this stuff, being able to pull from basically any part of the Batman universe, even like, you know, like I said, Batman Beyond, like nodding to it. And even if it's just like an Easter egg, it's like, it's a, a lot of fun that we've been able to do. It's kind of like a love letter to Gotham, actually. And Maps, so cute. Look at that. And Carl draws are so perfect. And this page is like one of the most brilliant pages that's ever been drawn in comics. Uh, the way he laid this page out was just incredible. As you're, you're walking up the stairs and then you keep walking up and you're still walking up, but then your, your eye is moving down. And then the last three panels going down but looking up at that bell and just the it's such it creates such a weird sense of vertigo when you read it you know like the the way you're moving in a different direction from the way that your eye is going and it's a uh, it's when carl drew this page i was like you're a genius like if you don't get like some kind of major genius award by the end of this uh by the end of this issue i'm just gonna freak out yeah incredible that bat symbol on the sky uh, i love it that was a big thing with this was like how kids see Batman and like living in Gotham and even though it's um it exists in kind of its own little bubble which is really nice uh, we, we get a lot of freedom to play around with stuff and no one really says we have to do anything and um, from like upper you know DC management they're just kind of hands off with us but we don't actually exist in a, a bubble because we're part of continuity things in uh, eternal affect what happens in Gotham Academy things in you know, there's there's a lot of Batgirl stuff because Brendan co-writes on Batgirl and I'm friends with Cameron and stuff. So we actually do a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, f fun back and forth between us. And so trying to find fun ways to like connect the stories and make it all feel like it's part of the same universe is a lot of fun. <coughs> but, you know, we, we have to make sure that you remember that it's Gotham and it is a story about living in Gotham. And part of that is seeing the back signal every night. and. Some people might be like, well, that's awesome. Look at that bat signal, really cool. And then other people would be like, oh, it's so annoying. It's just so bright, you know? Like, how are you gonna look at the stars when the bat signal's like really bright in the sky all the time? Um, and it's also gotta be cloudy for the bat signal to even work. So I don't know, a lot of logistics there they didn't really think about when they built that thing. And uh, there's always gotta be like a part of the school that's off limits. So we have a North Hall which has been a little damaged and it's out of out of use right now. And that's one of the big secrets is what happened in the North Hall, what happened to all over the summer and what's the connection between them. So we're slowly kind of revealing all these things and uh, yeah, to plant all these seeds is a lot of fun. And then poor maps. Oh no, what's going to happen? Oh, oh no. This page is so great too with these elongated panels that he used. And this is another thing. Carl's such an... Um, I don't want to say unconventional storyteller, but it is. It's like, it's very different and no one's really doing the type of storytelling that he's doing. And no one really can. Uh, like the, the looking down on that first panel, then looking up at Olive, and then, you know, we're looking up at her again as she jumps over. And you, I, I feel like he did such a good job making Map such a likable character that when she actually falls over the, uh, the side of the building, I'm like, oh no, what's gonna happen? Maybe that's just me. But I actually felt like looking at this page was, uh, was really cool. And I, coming from like an artist perspective, you know, because uh, I usually only uh, drew for other writers and then actually having to turn it around and write for other artists is cool because uh, seeing these pages come in, I'm like, this is what it's like. This is what it feels like. It's amazing. Uh, and I actually, I read Gotham Academy through all the time and like look at the art and it's great. When I draw comics for other people, I'm like, I get the book back and I'm like, I'm going to put it on the shelf and never look at it. I cannot look at my own artwork <laughs> ever again. So it's, it's, like, it's nice to work on a book that I can actually go back and, and look at without cringing about my horrible art. So that, the bells that he drew there, it's perfect. And uh, the, the coloring on this is, you know, props to that. But Carl's been working on this. So uh, animated style almost, well, totally animated actually, with the painted backgrounds and then cell shaded characters. He's been working on this for a while. He did Teen Titans year one it was a few years ago. I don't remember what year. Um, but it had a very similar look, and he also worked with, uh, I think he goes by Geyser, but his name's Romain Gachet. He's French, and he's a phenomenal colorist. Uh, he paints a lot. And we've had a, a few 
uh, different because the speed it just takes so long to work on it's such a labor intensive process that we've had a lot of different colors kind of step up to the plate and um, so right now we worked with Dave McKegg helped out and uh, we've got this oh I can't remember her last name Michelle I'm blanking on her last name right now horrible but she worked on the last issue and Serge Lapointe who was used to be an inker um, he's actually doing some coloring work on it as well so the colorists change a lot but everyone's been really consistent with the style and I don't the, the great thing about it is I can't even notice like the, there's been changed that many changes in colorists I keep joking that it's like our drummer from Spinal Tap they just keep exploding I'm like I can't <laughs> we can't hold the colorists why not it's just such a labor intensive book but the product is gorgeous it's absolutely beautiful um, I just wish we had like two months to do each one but these bats like god look at it it looks so good yeah oh Bruce Wayne blah 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 yawn He's so boring. <laughs> That's the, the nice thing about it was bringing Bruce Wayne in as a as a guest speaker, you know. And when you're just, I don't know, just thinking about speakers in school, and it's like, uh, you know, I, I can't remember listening to any of them. So that's what we we just Bruce Wayne. Okay, what's the most boring speech he can make? Blah blah blah. I don't even think I, I read it. <laughs> and then that yawn that we put in it, when we got the PDF for like the last. Um, they send us PDFs to approve all the, the dialogue and lettering and everything. And as we were going through and just, you know, we make some small changes with the PDF. Usually it's like, oh, this word balloon should be a little higher or maybe split this word balloon up into two or, oh, maybe we want to change this line of dialogue. So it's usually a lot of minor changes right before the printing, pro before it goes to print. And as we were reading through this, we read that first panel and it's just it's blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yawn. <laughs> Ended up going in there just because it was such a, a perfect, a perfect little uh, comment on poor boring Bruce, and then uh, yeah the girls falling behind them and the bats everything and then you look up in the sky and there's the bat signal, but oh man Bruce Wayne knows all of what is going on, I wonder, I wonder how Bruce Wayne and Olive know each other yeah and she's totally freaked out by Batman, I love that second panel, like the <coughs> the um light shining in her eyes is perfect but that's another that's one of the other mysteries is how does Olive know Batman well you'll just have to keep reading because we haven't figured it out yet these I mean DC Comics used to be 22 pages now they're 20 and I wish we had 22 because I would have added extra pages onto like <laughs> every single scene here um, we actually lobbied for 22 when we started the issue because we wanted to put a map of the school grounds at the end uh, it would be the map that maps is drawing um, and it would be something that we could keep adding to, but they said no. Hmm. And then there's like, you know, this scene could have been two pages easily. Uh, it's, but it's a matter of putting all the information that you want in like the shortest amount of time as possible and just trying to make it punchy, but not feel like jarring or like confusing. And uh, yeah, that's a big challenge for me because I would like to do each page, each comic in like 40 pages easily. <laughs> easily. That, oh man, Olive's look in that panel is perfect. All of those, just that, ugh, just not again, that stupid bad signal. And poor Lucy again. And this is another thing, like Lucy and her, their last interaction wasn't so great. And having Olive come back and be like, you know what, it's just the bad signal. Let's, uh, you know, all of, Lucy's really upset here and on the next page. Um, yeah, she kind of helps her up and they have a little laugh. And it's that, I don't know, just a, a human interaction between people and friends and that we, that was the, that was the big thing in each issue there's, there's a major change that happens and in this issue it's Olive kind of coming out of her shell and where she was originally trying to push maps away then she goes and, and they kind of rekindle their friendship and in this one it's her and, and Lucy and they kind of butt heads a little bit and Lucy's like when are you going to clean your side of the room and Olive's like nah, get out of my face I'm really upset. <laughs> and no one understands me where and uh and you know and at the end of the issue they've they've uh you know she kind of helps her out and lucy's all scared and olive's like don't worry about it it's just that stupid bad signal come on let's hang out in front of my cool house of secrets poster so good. those it's like that stuff like carl just adds that in it's so good yeah to be continued this is such a great cover again carl is just knocking it out of the park um yeah, it was a, it's, it's kind of a creepy issue. We had this whole weird cult thing going on with this Order of the Bat 
And uh, he just kind of took it to a next level in a blindfold. I was like, really, Carl, a blindfold? Okay, that's awesome. The fire, it's so great. Millie Jane Kalapot. When, when the trade hits on this, I think I would like to redo the text on that first panel. It's weirdly stretched. Like, I got it back and I was like, why is this text so stretched? Um, it, it really bothers me. So, <laughs> I don't know if it bothers anybody else. <coughs> So that's something that's going to probably get changed. But that's the nice thing about uh, working in issues is like you can kind of go over things and then the trade is going to be the actual, the final form. It's final form. Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of fun. And then there's a little bit of info dump. But it's, it's uh, this is fun, writing stuff about Millie Jane Cobblepot. This was, some of it was stuff that was stolen from, stolen from actual Civil War uh, journals from soldiers and stuff. So... <clears throat> There's a lot of there's a lot of fun stuff. It actually reads like a, a dark, a pretty dark book, but uh, she's all into her gothic, her gothic literature. Yeah, that that bat signal again. It's great. It's Carl's incredible. Yeah, the way he's just bringing the school to life is like we don't even have to talk about it, and then he'll just draw like what I'm seeing in my head. It's kind of weird. It's like we share a hive mind or something. Um, yeah, this this issue started out. Uh, it started out differently, I think, in our original our original version, and we actually went over this issue several times with me, Brendan, and Carl, just like we had something punchier in the beginning. So then, you know, we decided to incorporate this this scene that was just a little. Olive does a lot of this oh, covering her mouth thing. That's her that's her move. <laughs> Some people have ticks that they do. She's always gasping and covering her mouth. It's adorable. Mm -mm. So then she's tired the next day in class because she didn't get any sleep. And there's Pomelo and Heathcliff making out on a desk. Little PDA right there. Um, so this is when we start talking about the ghost a little more, which people have talked about. And uh, it turns out Pamela knows something. She's a total bitch. Look at that face. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Carl draws. It's so good. This is just going to be me talking about how great Carl's art is, which, you know. Um, and Heathcliff is one of my favorite characters. We get a little more into him in, like, the the fourth and fifth issue, but he's a he's kind of a sweetheart. You see a softer side to him. Right now he's just like kind of a boo. He's, he's he needs help with his Yeah, Olive used to be his tutor, so he, he's he needs a little help in school. He might be like a year ahead and having to retake some classes. Um the Draculords at the bottom, right? It's like a little drawn on the chalk chalkboard that's a a band from Batgirl. It's like a, if if anyone's reading Batgirl right now, there's a few like, kids listen to, listen to bands from Burnside right now. Yeah, this is more talking about the cobble pots. So this is actually kind of fun, because, you know, if anyone's asked me what I'm doing, I'm probably researching the history of the cobble pots. And uh, a lot of this stuff is from Scott Snyder's Gates of Gotham, and, uh, you know, reading some of that stuff. And Scott's actually, if any of you guys read Scott Snyder's work, um, his idea that, like, every building in Gotham has a story and Gotham has such a rich history it's actually been uh, well, that was one of the influences when I was pitching the book that was one of the things I was like you know in Scott Snyder's stuff Scott says that every building in Gotham has a story so that's what we're doing a lot of this stuff in uh, Gotham Academy is looking back at the history of Gotham and looking back at um, you know older older figures and so much of I mean Gotham's got some great old families too. I mean, you got the Dents, you got the Cobblepots. I mean, it just goes on and on. And none of that stuff has like really been talked about too much. So we can just really write what we want. And it's just been great to kind of build up the history of uh, history of all these stories. And we're like going pretty far back into like, you know, Gotham's history, uh, where you know Batman's solving crimes that happened like, you know, right now. Uh, these kids are kind of coming together to solve crimes that might have happened like 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So that's, it's, it's fun. It's like a, you know, it's just, a, it's a, it leaves room for a lot of stories because you're not just talking about these kids, we're talking about these kids plus the events of the past and how that affects them growing up in a, a place that, you know, you're surrounded by it. It's cool, it's cool to be living in that kind of, or it's fun to think about anyway. We got more food, you know, some crazy, lunch food who goes to school with lunches like that i don't know it's, it looks delicious though um you got some square potato on the side and there's a new character here named eric and uh, i actually that little he's drawing a, a sketch of maps in his book and i drew that 
there's a Carl's like, can you draw this? Uh, there's a lot of little, little fun things. And it's, you know, he drinks a soda at lunch. Everyone knows that kid. What are you having for lunch? Oh, Pepsi. <laughs> so he's, he's that guy. And uh, Matt's just being awkward, yeah. So Eric is a character. He'll come back in a little bit later. Uh, this, the way Carl laid this page out, and I gotta talk about it, it's like we start on Kyle, and then it goes to Olive, and then it wrote the camera, actually camera, quote unquote, rotates around them as they come back. It, like the way he designed that page was crazy, and then the way that it was lettered was so careful, because you have to read, oh, um, hi, and then, you know, you haven't touched your lunch, and then down and over. So to make you, <clears throat> the way your eye actually travels through this page is pretty incredible. And uh, yeah, Carl is just a genius at this layout stuff. Um, so good. But there's no way that I could have written a, a description for that layout. It's, that's all out of his head. He's so good. Oh, there's uh, the library there and there's a little owl statue. So this, we're all like, it's all winks and nods to like other, other things. And I loved this page too because of just the awkwardness of it. It's the clock going, and uh, yeah, I think I think in the final we might put something in that book that she's reading, so it's not just a blank page, but you know, so good. I love libraries, and so doing this uh, this scene was a lot of fun to write. I don't know if Carl liked drawing it though. Books, books, books. Who knows? And this is the bookworm. If I remember, you know, you guys watched the old Adam West show. Do you guys remember the bookworm in that? ugly leather suit, <laughs> brown leather suit and a hat with a lamp on it. <laughs> and he's a bad guy because he just loves books so much. <laughs> he loves books. <laughs> it's so good. So we're like, we're using the bookworm and they're like, yeah, that's fine. Like, this is the thing, like, we get away with so much crap in this, in this series because they just, they're just like, oh, whatever, just do what you want, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so to take in a character like the bookworm that's never I don't think it's ever been used, definitely not in the New 52, and it might have only been used, um, oh no, actually, Bookworm was in Batman 66, I think, in the, uh, the Batman 66 comic, but as far as other comics, I don't think he's really been used that much. <laughs> Writing the Bookworm's dialogue is, uh, is so much fun, because it's so over the top and bizarre, actually, and yeah, he's talking about Cicero. Cicero, I love it. So she's looking for this book. And, uh, oops, instead she finds Mystery Man with Gambit eyes. <laughs> Gambit eyes. That's a thing, you guys. Uh, so who is this guy? We don't know yet. Um, but he, he slowly gets revealed more and more, and he's, oh my god. This guy is so much fun. He's so, so stupid. <laughs> I love these characters. I love every single one of them. Um, I don't know if we found out his name yet. Oh, mm, we might have. No, not yet. Okay, <laughs> we find out his name in issue four then. Must be issue four. I'm having trouble keeping them all because they all mush into one gigantic story in my head. So, um, yeah, this is a character that's going to have some, uh, some fun stuff happen with him. And Olive and him have this weird connection that you start finding out about. She keeps seeing him around the school and is like, who is that guy? And then it just gets really awkward and Kyle's like, you know, really jealous, but she's like, no, it's not like that, or, but it kind of is a little bit, I don't know. It's really confusing. It's complicated, you guys. It's feelings. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we got this, oh, there's a secret book. This is, they find a, a book right now, um, and it's the Diary of Millie Jane Cobblepot, which they're all reading, but this is a special edition because someone's annotated it, and they're trying to figure out who wrote these notes in there, what do they mean? Um, there's a map, there's some secrets, uh, and Pomelin really wants this book, so we're trying to figure out why. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, Pomelin is, I think around here is when she starts becoming people's favorite characters. Because she's such a bitch. It's great. I love her jewelry, too. Um, we've got a friend up in Montreal named Elaine Ho, and she makes a lot of jewelry. Uh, that's just incredible. And so some of the jewelry that Pomelin wears is actually jewelry that our friend Elaine has designed. Um, really good. So yeah, she's uh, in the in the bottom panel. She says, "Smell you later, bandwagon." She calls her bandwagon. <laughs> it's kind of an insult to that. I love it. Pomelin's insults are like my favorite to write. Oh, there's some Milo, Professor Milo. Um, science class. 
a lot of fun. I want to do another science class scene because there's so much that could be done in that classroom that you know we're just kind of getting to. But all the taxidermy stuff. Are you guys familiar with Carl Kirschel's other book? Um, he does a book called Abominable Charles Christ The Abominable Charles Christopher. Do you guys have any here or not? It's a, uh, it's a web comic, and he he does like he self publishes them as graphic novels. But it's it's like a free to read online. You guys should check it out. It's about um, this like Sasquatch guy, and all these little animals. I mean, it's about more than that, but it's, um, he does it every week, every Wednesday he updates, but every, every time we can write animals into Gotham Academy, I'm like, we got to do it for Carl, because he loves drawing animals. <laughs> he does. He loves animals. Um, even horses. Yeah, even horses, I'm sure. Fuzzy animals, really, but like, he likes birds a lot. Yeah. So we, there's, uh, there's another animal. There's Ham, Ham the dog. This uh, Kyle tennis scene was very important. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, Carl did not like drawing those bleachers either. He was not happy. So um, I think uh, seeing, seeing Kyle in action was kind of fun. And we don't really get a sense of the two of them together until issue three. But showing her watching him and thinking about him and being conflicted, really. Uh, conflict is very important. Um, but... It, I don't know. It's just, it's one of those things. Everyone's got one of those, you know, she wants to break up with them. She doesn't know how. She's not sure if they're broken up yet. I don't know. It's really confusing, you guys, this whole, <laughs> this whole thing. I'm not even sure what they're up to. Uh, Mrs. McPherson is uh, a good, she, she's another original character for the, for the series. And she kind of comes in as like someone that, like a, a, an adult that she can, Olive kind of trusts a little bit and uh, can confide in. Um, and McPherson is fun because we made her smoking, which was cool, even though she's like not supposed to. Uh, we, we've gotten away with a lot with this. And when we were talking about her character, we've got all these wacky teachers. We've got Milo, we've got the bookworm, we've got Hammerhead. We've got all these like really oddball professors. And then Miss McPherson, who's this like, she's super cool. And we're like, we gotta make, we gotta give her something that's like a little, we gotta make her a little weird. Smoking is one. She's got a tattoo. You guys haven't seen it yet, though. And uh, she's got a dog named Ham. So that's, that's Ham. So she's, she's by like kind of talking about this character in the beginning, she was just kind of this, I don't want to say boring mentor character, because um, there's a lot that happens with her later on in the series. But I was like, we need, she needs a little more. Like, we got to describe her more. Like, tell me about this woman. Who is she? She's got a, she's got a tattoo that she's regrets she's got <laughs> she's got a bad smoking habit and she has a dog named ham so that's a good start but uh, she's a lot of fun and uh, I hope we see more of him later because because he's great <coughs> this is a uh, Carl uh, actually added that second the second panel when we were going through it and he's like you know this is just your standard laugh and plaster wall you know maps turns around she's great just gonna break through a wall what are you doing I don't even know and uh, then they see yeah, then they see these um, cult members again. It's the idea of throwing these two characters together. We've got Olive and Maps and getting them to follow this mystery and figure out what's going on. It's a graveyard scene, of course. Oh, an owl. Carl loves drawing the birds, I mentioned before. <laughs> we actually, we did a lot of this dialogue together in the car. We did a small, um, like, Gotham Academy signing tour. And as we got the final PDF in, like, in, in the car actually, and we were all going through it and just uh, the three of us together in a car listening to like Final Fantasy soundtracks. Because <laughs> that was the only thing on Carl's phone and it was the only one that we could hook up to the car radio. So that's what we listened to. And uh, it was, you know, Carl would be like, so Becky, what Final Fantasy is this one from? I was like, oh, three. <laughs> I totally know it. Um, but uh, it's, it's, those guys are really good friends of mine, I think, which makes this comic so much more fun to, to work on and write. And Carl, as the artist, too, has, um, you know, he's just as responsible for this story as Brendan and I are. So um, he should almost get like a co-writing credit, too, because we go back and forth so much on character stuff and dialogue. And, you know, he'll even call us out like when me and Brendan are being a little bit lazy. He's like, well, I don't think this is very realistic, you guys. Like, I don't think Pomelin would actually, like, you know, do these things or 
So then we have to rethink a scene because he's like, he's right, we're being lazy. We're just doing a convenient... This, this scene happens this way because it's convenient and not because the characters are actually, um, you know, acting the way they should. So he, he really challenges us to, to, do, to do some fun stuff with these characters, like uh, a bat cult. Look at that. Yeah, there's some fun Riley in up there. A little, some wink and a nod to Lovecraft. And then, uh, yeah, things get really weird as they go down the stairs. This, the color on this, though, the way it changes from blue and then blue to red, it's just, oh, it's beautiful. Olive gets really scared and then having her kind of at the end have the courage to uh, confront these people because she sees the book. She sees the, the Millie Jane Cobblepot diary and she realizes at the end that it's Pomelin. So she kind of, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't as scary as I thought it was. And so she gets the courage to go and confront her. She's like, I love this. The, the way Carl laid this out with her, I mean, the way we wrote it was just all of walks forward, knocks over a candle, some things catch fire. And I mean, it was probably more complicated than that, but that was the gist of it. But the way he laid it out with the three panels up top and then, you know, simultaneously happening. Because uh, when you read it, you read it almost as it's simultaneous. You know, she's walking forward, but at the same time she trips and then things start catching on fire and the, the background lights up. I, it's just, he's so good. Yeah. Just things that I would never even think about doing with, with layout and design. He's, uh, he has it in spades. He's so amazing. Yep. And this we kind of start revealing about uh, her mother and her past, I think. It's good. Pomelin being terrified. It's a, it's a great panel, too, because Pomelin, who's, as we know, is a total bitch. But then here she's frightened. She's actually, you know, I believe she's frightened in that last panel. Just her expression is, uh, I think, the way Carl's able to convey that uh, really brings you to a different side of the character, you know. Not, she's not just someone who can uh, bully people, but she's actually terrified right now. She's actually a little scared, so. Serious, you guys. This is serious stuff. Yeah, this cover, oh, I gotta talk about this cover a little bit, though. It's so good. Um, Carl's just like, he sent him this sketch, and it, at first it just seems so simple, you know, the sketch, the idea that you're looking straight down and she's just crossing Batman out on her desk and the way it's drawn it actually looks like someone's etched a bat symbol into their desk that's exactly how it would look like because how many times have I carved in like a Metallica on my desk it's like you know that's it's great the tension yeah here we wanted to do a flashback because we had to start with what happened we didn't we didn't want to pick it up right where we left off with issue two because it just seemed like it would kind of drag on a little bit. We wanted to skip, we wanted to go right to detention. So actually the dialogue that we have here is Olive talking to Colton about how she got to detention. And as you're reading it, you kind of realize there's two people talking. And at the last episode, he calls her a drip. <laughs> and then she's drenched with water. Um, so here we are in detention. And there's, um, I actually drew the backgrounds in this, this page which was fun. Uh, so Car that's the nice thing about working with Carl is um, he works digitally and now because I've started working digitally as well, if he ever gets in a crunch or he needs a little help or I get bored and want to draw some bricks, I'm like, hey, do you need backgrounds, John? And he'll just upload the pages already there on the server. All I have to do is download it and then re-upload it. So uh, because I've been in the UK for a little bit, I'm a little bit ahead of him time-wise, five hour difference. So he'll upload pages at night and then I'll work on them. And by the time he wakes up, they're done. He's like, it's like a background fairy just came in and like <laughs> did all my backgrounds for me. It's, uh, it's good. I just use the same brushes that he does. So you can't, I don't think you could really tell it was a different person. And the coloring makes it pretty consistent. And there's Aunt Harriet again with the teacup. She's great. <laughs> I love the way he draws her. And there's Lucy. Oh man, that just cutting right to Lucy screaming. She just so scared all the time. Um, and this is when we first see the ghost, the ghost of Millie Jane Cobblepot, who we're finding out is uh, actually that Sam Pomelin's been trying to summon her for a while. We don't know why yet, but she's, she's hell-bent on summoning Millie Jane Cobblepot for some reason. And I love that you only see the shoes 
for some reason that's so creepy. It's so much more creepy than like seeing the whole thing, and that's the great, the I think one of the biggest lessons we learn about from horror is the less you show, the scarier it is. And uh, that's, it's, it's such a, when you actually look at that one scene of just creepy floating feet, just, it's, it's a, I love it. That was all Carl too. This page was really interesting because it was jam packed. It was um, 10 panel page, which is kind of unprecedented. And there's a lot of info being dumped here but we wanted to work it in a way that um, just felt uh, a little natural and didn't really feel like an information dump. And it feels like, you know, you're just, these two are kind of talking while all this crazy stuff is happening. Well, then you get Hammer and, and Milo talking, interrupting them. And that, oh, Lucy in the bottom, it's hilarious. She's just passed out like, <laughs> so good. Um, yeah. But these are more like Carl's stunning layouts. Uh, the two girls, here's where they kind of start becoming friends now. We have this uh, reconciliation, I guess, where they kind of both agree that they need to work together to figure this, this stuff out. And Pomelin wants Olive's help, and Olive is like reluctant to, uh, reluctant to help her. But, you know, they're doing this project together, and they both have a, a similar passion for this Millie Jane book, so. And I think it's great the idea that like, you know, even something simple as like a class project or literature can bring two people together. And Heathcliff comes back in, he, he's talking about this new band from Burnside. It's actually from a, back, yeah, a band from Batgirl. And I think you find, he's talking that one of the, yeah, the band has a new singer and you find out who that singer is in Batgirl, so. It's just fun stuff that we can go back and forth between our teams. And poor Kyle. Look at him. He's really so sad. Yeah. This is one of my favorite scenes. I think it's uh, really melancholy. Uh, it gives you a lot of information. That's, that's the thing also. There's so much information in this story that has to be given out. And we are very careful to do it in a way where it doesn't feel like we're just telling you things that have happened. Even though you find out a lot about what happened to her over the summer and you know, why she's been avoiding him, and it's a very tender scene. We have to keep that tenderness, but at the same time hit you with all this information. <laughs> so it's this weird balance of trying to get the story across, but at the same time trying to get you with all the feelings um, that we, that we want to make you feel. This, again, look, Carl, look at this, the layout of this upside down. Olive's upside down in that second panel, but you don't even notice it because she's, it's just a reflection. And the way that the, the word balloons are all, or the, the panel borders are all wiggly, like it's, and, and the way that it's colored, oh my god, I can't, like, he sends me these pages and I'm like, my jaw is on the floor literally every single time. <coughs> yeah. And that just, the, the, her putting her, her finger on his, just that one little touch is like, it says so much about these two characters. Uh, and their relationship, you know, she still really cares about him, but so much of it is in the little gestures and not so much in the words. And I, yeah, I, it's coming at this story from like, you know, I'm kind of new to writing. This is my, the first book I've really written for someone else. So seeing this kind of come to life and being really aware of like the visual angle of it and the, the, the acting, and Carl's just like hitting it out of the park. Really good, and at the end, Kyle's uh, such a sweetheart. In the end, he just wants her to be friends with Maps. Oh, so sad. And then, oh, cut, we cut and we get to Maps. And she's got her another bag of food. There we get more food in this issue. And she's got this, I didn't get to get around to this yet, but uh, she's got a bag of riddles, which are candies. And in the future, we'll probably find out you unwrap the riddle and it's got a little pun on the inside of it, so. I can't wait to start writing those. <laughs> but that's the idea, is that there's like little riddles on the inside of each candy wrapper. So it's like a little nod to, of course, the Riddler, right? Um, and this scene was a lot of fun to write. We were like, well, what has to happen? There has to be a rooftop stakeout. There needs to be snacks and a tent and, you know, some crazy lighting. Looks so good. on the And the red skies, uh, Carl's really got a vision for Gotham and his Gotham includes red skies at night and it is, it's just beautiful. And at the end of this page, she finds a little pin. It's an Ashes on Sunday pin. 
So that's a, that's a clue right there. We're, we got clues, you guys. Um, you know, going through the mystery again, and there's this there's this guy again with the gamba eyes. Who's he? And he's reading Le Mort Arthur. Um, some more medieval literature for you guys. Uh, and it's great because Olive's Olive's uh, sitting there on the roof spying him with the binoculars because she's a total creep. She she sees this guy and is like asks him like, "What are you reading?" And he turns around and shows her the book. What? How can you hear? Her? How is that possible? Is it have to do with his gamba eyes? <laughs> You'll just have to read and find out. It's so good. <laughs> I'm so pleased with myself about this book. Look, <laughs> I think it's just, it's so much fun to, uh, to write. And <clears throat> here we actually get a look at the North Hall through the binoculars. And Olive actually sees this thing. And, uh, and Maps is like, come on, you believe me now? You believe me now? Like, I did see something in there. And it's one of those things that in the first issue, we didn't really show anything. We just had people talking about it because you want to think, oh, maybe it's not real. And Olive's very skeptical of it. And we, as the reader and as the writers also, are very skeptical of what's happening. Um, this ghost stuff. And as we go through it, you know, we see, we see the ghost. We see this weird summoning ritual. We see the eyes in the North Hall. And uh, Olive starts to get caught up in this mystery as, um, you know, as we write it and as you guys read it. It's this idea that um, slowly, we don't, you don't want to hit people over the head with this stuff right away. But the slow reveal is, for some people, I think, really frustrating. But for me, it's a lot of fun to, to write. It's, I guess some people call it a slow burn, but it's actually not, because we. I feel like we're moving at breakneck speed. Like every issue, I'm like, there's so many things happening. Each, each page has like six panels on it. It's actually a very dense comic. But sometimes you, you finish an issue, and I'm like, man, nothing happened in this issue. <laughs> you know? It's really a, yeah, next day. So much of it is colors, like the last page was so dark, and this page you're jumping so bright, and immediately you think, next day. You don't even need the caption there. The caption would be totally uh, redundant. And Maps, she says her own sound effect. <laughs> Shaw. <laughs> so who does that? Maps does that. And the idea that she hits him with the, uh, the note on the side of the head was just what he did to Olive in the beginning. Um, so there's a lot of that little, like, going back to issue one, going back to issue two, Things kind of, uh, I like to do this anyway, where you, you're constantly referring to things that happened in past issues just to, you know, bring things around and it's not just a, there's never anything, nothing just happens. Everything happens and then we're always going to refer back to it. Everything kind of happens for a reason. So in this issue, they recruit Colton because <clears throat> we know he's a sneak and a liar and a thief. Um, he's boosting parts from McPherson's car right now, and we don't know why, but we'll probably find out later <laughs> what he's using this for. Um, yeah, they, they hire him to pick some locks at the school. I love this shot of the three girls and uh, Maps in her little, her little trousers. <laughs> it's so cute. Um, and he's waiting at the fountain, and Maps is totally enamored with Colton right now, and she's just the biggest nerd. I love it. Uh, writing all these characters is a lot of fun because they're all so different, like their personality. So going through their voices, and this is why I like doing this with Brendan and Carl because everybody does voices. When we, I'm not going to do voices, but because um, I haven't had enough to drink. But uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a, it's it's so much fun working with those guys because we just read the dialogue back to each other and we're constantly tweaking stuff and constantly going back and um, right here. Pomlin calls Colton Cool Breeze. She's like, take off those glasses, Cool Breeze. And Brendan wrote that line. He's like, and Carl and I like, were hysterical over it for like days. We were like, Cool Breeze, nice one, Brendan. <laughs> Good one, man. And, uh, and that became part of Pomlin. And, and he just wrote that in just off the cuff, just was like, maybe we'll think of something better. But Cool Breeze, for now, is pretty good. And that became part of Pomlin's character, was just making up stupid nicknames for people. So she calls all of Bandwagon and uh, like that's just that's so now whenever all of uh, whenever Pomlin has to has to insult someone we're all we're like constantly racking our brain for something better than the last thing that you know we thought of but it's it's funny how characters kind of build themselves like that and uh, not to get too worried about it and just to let like, it like let it like yeah that's Pomlin Pomlin it it works for her right making up weird names for people <laughs> so random but uh, it ends up working. <clears throat> And this we've got more uh, Olive hallucinating about seeing Batman again. She's terrified of this guy. And uh, we, we will, you will know why by the end of the sixth issue. 
that all kind of happens. Um, this this page with maps taking Olive's hand, we had it written in the script, like maps takes Olive's hands in this panel. And the way Carl drew it, just the one finger, you know, he like, she reaches out and it's just the detail of that, just holding onto a finger is like so touching. I don't know, it's such like a, I mean, it's, it's reminiscent of something a kid would do, but uh, that, it's that level of Carl thinking about, you know, Maps' character and the scene and those little details like that really, I think, help make, bring these characters to life even more. Um, you know, because I, I read this page and I'm like, oh, the, the finger, ah, it's just, I love Maps so much. Oh, it's ridiculous. Isn't that like a little callback to when um, Olive holds Carl's Yeah, well, Olive, sort of just yeah, that exactly. Exactly. So Olive just put one finger, you know, on on Kyle's hand, just like a few fingers, and it's just this, yeah. The the the, the strength of these characters have like I I love them so much. It's ridiculous, actually. And I you know I always say like oh Pomelo's my favorite character. It's like no 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 Maps is definitely my favorite. No 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 I like Olive and Colson too. Also I like them all the same, but like I don't know. Yeah, that's great. It's it's we're lucky we've been so. Uh, you know, we've, we've been able to just do whatever we want with this, but the, the fact that we've been able to just create like 20 new characters for the series and everyone's just like, just do what you want. And they kind of just trust us with it. We've got a nice, um, this is another one of uh, that on the previous page of, yeah, this one, Carl moving the camera, quote unquote, around camera and a <clears throat> Olive's narration kind of echoing Pomelin and then you kind of get this Olive turning around like a slow turn between every other panel. Uh, he's he's just really good at like I can almost see it animated. It's uh, great. And then Maps drooling with her like swirly eyes in in that panel. It's it's great. Actually drooling with the sound effect. It says drool like <laughs> as if it wasn't like enough. Uh, and Colton is a fun character too. And you know he's like the prankster and the liar and. He, we kind of know this about him, and I think you get a lot because he's got a lot of he's got a lot of sass, that guy. But there's a lot that we don't know about him yet, and I'm like, as we find out right now, you're getting like the other side of Pomelin. But as we go further, you're gonna get that other side of Colton too. And you, I don't know, we have we have lavish backstories for all of our characters, and we know everything about them, so it's gonna be kind of fun to to continue with this series forever. Um, right. So this is the North Hall, and we've finally broken in. Um, yeah, there's a there's a lot in here. It's cool. Pomelin's looking at a a cobblepot painting there, and I think Colonel Nathan Cobblepot. That was from Gates of Gotham, I think. Uh, maybe, but yeah, he's he's a character from one of the, the Snyder Scott Snyder stories. Um, Maps wants a lock picking club. I mean, it's it, it kind of writes itself, really, except that we write it. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and it's great right here. She's uh, Pomelin is looking at this, uh, the, the painting, and she's actually calling Olive over. You got to come check this out. And that idea that we've gotten to that point with these characters that she actually wants to show Olive something. In the beginning, she's push, pushing Olive over and making fun of her, and like just being, a, you know, the worst person. Uh, and now she's kind of like, you know, what's going on? So. Olive's stuck in the door and she's having this horrible flashback of Batman and a burning building and it's kind of the worst thing. Um, and she realizes she's been here before and, uh, and something horrible was going on, fire. And fire is a big, you know, we saw in the previous issue when she lights the candle and uh, all this huge fire erupts. Um, and then we've got fire in the North Hall. It kind of makes you wonder what's going on with fire and Olive, I don't know. Hmm. And then Pomelin actually comes out to, to help her out, even though she's helping her up by like pointing her finger in her face and being like, come on, get it together. What are you doing? Uh, she's actually, you know, brings her inside and is, I, it's like, it's fun to work with. The, you've got the friendship between Olive and Maps, which is a very loving sisterly kind of, I mean, even though, you know, I have a sister and her and I aren't always getting along, uh, but there is, you know, that feeling of family and, uh, between her and Maps and like looking out for someone uh, and then Pomelin and Olive who she's definitely you know sees her in the doorway and is like come on let's go but like they're friends but it's a different type of friendship 
and uh, bringing these characters together is like that's part of the fun of it is to be you know think about the friendships that I had when I was growing up and thinking about the different types of layers there you know trying to peel those layers back uh, it's, it's one of the big one of the big things about this series and one of the most fun it's actually one of the themes of the, the, the series as well so it's a lot lots to do there and yeah here we get a giant hole a giant pit who doesn't love a giant hole in the ground <laughs> and uh, and this is actually fun. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever had the the opportunity to stick your hand in a really dark hole. It is terrifying. Um, I was. I, it's true. It's true. I was actually. Um, where was I? I was recently. Where was it? Um, yeah, we were we were up in uh, we were up in Edinburgh. We were at Craig Miller Castle, and there is a there was a. It looked like a window, but it, there was darkness on the other side of it. And it was like, oh, I wonder how deep this, and you put your hand in and it just disappears. And it's like, I'm terrified right now of what is in this hole. And you know nothing's there, because it's just, it's just brick on the other side. But I was leaning my arm in and I couldn't feel anything. There was nothing there, but it was terrifying. And it was like, this is the, uh, this is the feeling, putting your hand somewhere where you, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be. You know, nothing might be there, but oh, something might be there at the end. And. Uh, Oh, whose hand is that? I don't know. I guess you have to wait until next issue. I know whose hand that is, <laughs> you guys. I know. I know. Um, yeah, this, uh, so Carl just, this is a really tricky scene to, to draw and he just nailed it. Um, and that's the fun thing is hanging every, every, the fun thing is this music that's happening right now. The other fun thing is ending every issue on a cliffhanger, uh, which, which we're trying to do. <clears throat> but hopefully, you know, we, we keep keep building that up and I don't know, do you guys want to know whose hand that is? I'm not gonna tell you. You're gonna wait. You're gonna have to wait until issue four, so <laughs> <laughs>